We must now move on to questions to the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment. And I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Mr. McCarthy. Mr. Deputy Speaker, question number one to the Minister. Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment. Thank you very much. And with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I will answer questions one, three, and eleven together. Uh, our renewables record has been very successful to date. That has been due to a combination of being able to harness our own natural resources whilst ensuring that the support costs are spread much wider than our Northern Ireland consumer base. But this means we are also unavoidably influenced by national policy decisions as borne out by the proposed early closure of the renewable obligations across the United Kingdom to onshore wind. I'm mindful of the uncertainty that this has been created around early closure to wind. Uh, my priority at present is to ensure that we have a timely and a managed closure of the existing scheme in Northern Ireland. I want to provide the certainty which delivers the most renewable deployment for the least cost to Northern Ireland consumers. Mr. McCarthy, for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his reply. However, can the Minister tell the Assembly what he plans to do during the next six months under the moratorium on uh, the new grid connections? I mean, there have been significant uh, difficulties with the uh, grid uh, connections and grid connection offers, and the member is correct. NIE had to set aside its normal 90-day period for making grid connection offers due to the surge in applications uh, which followed the regulator's determination that NIE could not require planning permission before making a grid connection. The grid I mean, just could not simply accommodate the level of increase and it requires specialist analysis and potentially uh, significant investment which would have to be paid for by consumers. NIE is already committed uh, to connecting projects which will almost double our installed renewable capacity. And this is a huge challenge. Uh, I don't have powers to intervene. I cannot direct NIE or SUNY to prioritise a certain technology over another. Well, Mr. Paul Given. The Speaker, um, could I ask the Minister in discussions with DEC? Um, have they outlined what the proposed backstop power now included in the energy bill yes. uh, will mean and what the consequences of that could be to the Northern Ireland ROC? Good question. Well, DEC has now included a backstop power within its proposed energy bill, as the member says, to protect uh, GB consumers should Northern Ireland take a different approach to narrow closure than in GB. The backstop power will give DEC powers to prevent GB suppliers redeeming uh, NI rocks from projects that accredit from 1 April 16 and do not meet the closure eligibility criteria that was equivalent to GB. This provides little comfort for those projects and has the potential to have wider implications for the whole renewables industry here. Well, Mr Danny Kennedy. Uh, Deputy Speaker, interested in the ministerial responses uh, thus far. But how does the Minister intend to deal with um, the ongoing uncertainty uh, created by his decision on the narrow issue last summer? And does he accept that uh, the delay uh, since uh, his closure consultation last uh, October has created all sorts of problems for the renewable sectors here? And does he have any plans to support the development of the industry after narrow ends? And, will he bring, and how will he bring certainty for investors, including many in my own constituency? Well, I want to, to bring certainty as soon as possible. I'm considering uh, a range of options, and I think the member will agree with me that DEC changed the policy. And yes, we can do what we choose to do where we have devolved powers, but as DEC has changed the policy, not once but a number of times, and I have spoken to the DEC Secretary of State. I went to London and I said, look, under the last coalition government, the previous minister agreed with you uh, a line which was then put out to the industry. The Conservative Party came into power as a single party and changed the goalposts for onshore 
win. They changed the goalposts, not me. They then changed at different times their position. And what I want to assure the House is, what I will always do is look at what delivers the best value to Northern Ireland. And unfortunately, I have had to deal with changing positions from deck, which has led to the uncertainty that we, we have. We will try to bring it to a conclusion as quickly as possible to allow people to go forward, but let no one misunderstand the changing position has come from the Department of Energy and Climate Change. Well, Mr. Martin Muller. Can Corlys Moe has fought the election arrest in the Fraggery Gajisha, and uh, we have all some sympathy with, with the minister in that uh, these decisions have emerged from London. But minister, to move on past the rock onto the RHI renewable heating incentive, we spent two distressing hours this morning in the Economic Committee listening to officials tell us that another bombshell has, has been dropped on the renewable industry sector that the RHI is, is order, to be removed. Order, order, please. Could and, I have a question? And minister, could you? guarantee us that you will give us clarity on that issue. You will work in collaboration with the sector and you will work also to include the committee as you reach a decision on this matter. And let the date not be, uh, let the date not be uh, next week, Minister. Well, you know, Prince, Deputy Speaker, I mean, there was an increase in demand for the Renewable Heat Initiative scheme at the end of last year. Uh, my department faces a huge budgetary pressure uh, given the decision of the Chancellor of the Exchequer to limit the amount of money paid to Northern Ireland out of the UK pot for renewable heat. Now, that's why I signalled my intention last week to ease that financial pressure, which could amount to over £27 million, by announcing an immediate closure to the scheme and by bringing forward an order to suspend the scheme as soon as possible. I want everyone to know that I'm listening to the industry and I'm listening to individuals uh, who are currently installing renewable heat uh, boilers. And I'll come back and try to give that clarity at the earliest possible date. Well, Mr. Alban McGuinness. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And unlike the previous questioner, I really don't have very much sympathy with the Minister in relation to uh, his summary decision in relation to the renewable heat initiative. This is not acceptable. And this will impact adversely on many small installers. Will the minister review his decision, uh, or will he take remedial action in order to uh, strengthen uh, those small tradesmen? Well, I, I do think the member has misunderstood what the Chancellor of the Exchequer has done in terms of renewable heat, and in terms of the fact that. Uh, the goalposts have been changed and a limit has been put on Northern Ireland. And if we go beyond that limit, we have to bear the costs of that uh, ourselves. Now, it was introduced in November 2012 to the non domestic sector and in 2014 to the domestic sector, and it has been taken up very successfully. There's over 3,500 renewable heating installations that have been incentivised to date. Uh, uptake has been higher than GB. We have exceeded uh, the Northern Ireland executive target of 2015, which was a 4% target, and we have around 6% of Northern Ireland's heating needs now provided through renewable heating technologies. But he would do well to look at the autumn statement uh, from the Chancellor and what follows that, and also to consider the costs to Northern Ireland. Well, Mr. Paul Free for a question. Question number two, please. Thank you very much. Uh, can I say, in February 2014, uh, my department contracted BT to deliver the Northern Ireland Broadband Improvement Project. That is primarily aimed at rural areas, and it seeks to extend the availability of primarily basic and, where possible, super-fast broadband to those who have limited choice across Northern Ireland, with a target of 45,000 premises. The project was scheduled to complete by the 31st of December 2015. However, there was engineering complexity, and that date has been extended by the three months to the 31st of March 2016. Uh, improvements have already been carried out to over 45, over 40,000 premises across Northern Ireland, and these include almost 5,000 premises uh, in postcode areas falling within 
the North Antrim constituency. On the 22nd of January, I announced the introduction of a satellite broadband scheme, which falls under the auspices of the Northern Ireland Broadband Improvement Project, and that's seeking to provide residents and businesses which are still experiencing speeds below 2 megabits per second with the option of applying for a subsidy up to £350 towards the cost of installing a satellite broadband connection. Mr. Free for supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer here today. Is the Minister aware of the concerns of my constituents whereby it seems to be that BT are actually degrading their copper system and their old systems? Uh, is the member aware of that, and what can, the member, what can the minister do to make sure that BT meet all of their obligations and do not let people uh, weather on the vine with regards to the copper system, where they are experiencing speeds, lower speeds than even this Christmas? No, I am aware of a lot of problems, uh, particularly in rural areas. I mean, uh, I think a number of months ago, West Tyrone uh, had been specifically speaking to me. I have had a number of issues also from people who have raised complaints with me that, yes, uh, if there is congestion on the system, the beam and different things is causing them effectively not to have uh, a service. Um, you know, not all areas will be able to access super fast once the Northern Ireland Broadband Improvement Project is completed. Um, we awarded the contract for the second project uh, to BT. Uh, the Superfast Broadband uh, Rollout Programme. But what I will do for the members, I'll take up uh, those specific issues with BT. I had a very detailed meeting with them uh, last week uh, with the senior officials with BT, where I raised a number uh, of these concerns because it is unacceptable, uh, particularly where I've got people coming to me whose children have to be taken either back to school or be driven down to the library just to get uh, their homework done. I have other children uh, that are experiencing extreme difficulties just managing against the curriculum, uh, and we're raising those with BT. And thirdly, you know, we have some hugely successful businesses in areas that with computer-aided design and CAD programs, which mu they must submit the tender, that people are literally leaving their machines on, computers on at night, in the hope that when they get up the next morning that uh, the, the the, it, their CAD or their specific design, which they must use to tender for business, uh, is through. And I'm not sure, and I'll emphasise to BT, that's not a set of circumstances we can condone in the future. Well, Mr. Cahill Boyland. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I do welcome the Minister's answer, but what is put to the Minister is this. Minister, what are we doing after spending millions of pounds on assisting BT to provide broadband? And still, we have major gaps right across the north, and in particular in Uri and Armagh. And I ask that question on behalf of Matthew Nugent of 58, Tavenamara Road, Kiarna, BT60, 3JA, who lives 90 metres from a box that was upgraded last year, and he's one of a number of people in rural Armagh and South Armagh that has no broadband provision after spending millions of public money on this matter. Well, there are important points. If he wants to send me that specific uh, case, uh, I'll certainly look at it. Uh, we are continuing to make broadband services widely available uh, via a mix of technologies. Um, almost 64 million, as the member says, has been invested since 2008 to encourage private sector upgrade to networks, particularly in rural areas. 79% uh, of households are currently accessing the internet. I find that a very difficult figure when I compare it to UK figures of 85%. And 72% of those who are, are accessing the internet are doing it through a broadband uh, connection. The number of premises that are connected to a broadband service offering speeds of two megabits per second or higher is continuing to increase. And it stands now at 94%. Uh, now, due to the extensive next generation access network put in place by my own department's investments, there have been over 239,000 fibre-based high-speed broadband connections to date. But while we acknowledge that download speeds in Northern Ireland are continuing to increase, uh, the average download speed stands at 28.3 uh, megabytes per second, and that is below the UK average of 29 
megabytes per second, and we will continue to pursue how we can get that to a more level playing field. Mr. Stuart Dixon. Thank you, um, Minister. Um, about the answers which you have given thus far with regards to BT, I declare a personal interest in that BT totally and utterly failed me in my service for a period of nearly two months. But in addition to that, as a result of that, I discovered that the green cabinets which BT have installed to provide their so called super fast broadband. Are only, have only set aside 60 per cent of the Cabinet to deliver that service. So in any one area, not everyone, even if they wish to purchase super-fast broadband, can have it. Is the Minister satisfied that 60 per cent per Cabinet is a reasonable commercial decision by BT? What, what I will do is I will specifically raise that particular case uh, with uh, BT. I am um, not satisfied with broadband provision across Northern Ireland. I don't think anybody that has a genuine interest in seeing all of Northern Ireland develop and knowing how much uh, particularly business depends upon a broadband connection. I mean, the rules are changing. And I'm with businesses in rural areas who have referred earlier to you are saying to me, we have to present it in this way. We need the connection uh, to actually do this. Um, so we will have to continue uh, to work to what is a very difficult system, but I do not think anybody in this House, and I accept that as Minister, could be satisfied with the level of complaints and dissatisfaction that we have, particularly from the rural community at this point in time. Mr Paul Given for a question. Mine, mine was joined to the first question, Deputy Speaker. Call Mr. Ross Hussey. Question four, Mr. Speaker. Okay, thank you, uh, to Mr. Hussey. The latest results from the Northern Ireland Composite Economic Index, uh, which measures economic activity, shows that we have experienced growth in three of the last four quarters, with an annual increase of 1.6%. Uh, despite those positives, the figures for the latest quarter were negative, and these findings are disappointing. I think most economists that are advising me are saying don't get too fixated on just one single quarter's data. Uh, Northern Ireland is relatively small. Uh, quarterly statistics, as the evidence shows, can be inherently volatile. Uh, there have also been substantial improvements in the local labour market during this time with unemployment continuing to fall, and private sector jobs are now at their highest level ever. Uh, we can't be complacent at that, but I think everybody in the House would like to celebrate the fact that unemployment is falling, and that the private sector is growing, and that the facts are the private sector is now at their highest number ever. Well, Mr. Hussey, for supplementary. Speaker. Is the Minister not concerned in terms of output? The Ulster Bank, for example, says that we grew in economic terms by between 1.5 and 2 per cent in 2015, whilst the rest of the UK grew by 2.3 per cent, and the Republic grew by over 5 per cent for the second successive year. Is he not concerned that we may be stagnating? I am always concerned uh, when it appears that there are other parts performing uh, better. Uh, I know that we can look at statistics in a range of ways. Uh, we have massive challenges to our manufacturing sector, but in terms of that, it is posting a 3 per cent uh, annual growth and has added 4,000 jobs over the past year. Uh, while we look at experience in a relative modest recovery since the local downturn, our biggest sector, the services sector, has posted 1 per cent annual growth with jobs in the sector now at an all-time high. A big issue for me and many in this House with constituencies dependent on construction. Uh, our construction sector was the most impacted during the downturn. But even here, we are seeing what appears to be very real signs of recovery. Uh, output is up 14 per cent on an annual basis, and the sector has added over added 870 jobs over the latest year of data. So if you look at quarterly figures, I, I do see concerns. I take the advice uh, that not to, to look at those, but also to note the volatility. 
And uh, if I look at the annual change in services, we're 1% up. In manufacturing uh, output, we're 2.9% up. And in construction output, we're 13.7% up. Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers. As Deputy Minister, your job entails marketing Northern Ireland throughout the world. I think we all admit that you do that enthusiastically. What economic levers can you use as you travel to attract new business into Northern Ireland? Well, I mean, the, the big one that we've been taking forward in this last particular period is, is the game changer of corporation uh, tax. That's when we asked the independent research to come to us uh, on the rate of 12.5% that we'll have from the 1st of April. Uh, the independent advice was that we should be looking at creating 30,000 additional jobs and that we should be growing our economy by almost 10% over 15 years. Now, in the last short period, I've taken, uh, I think it was 13 companies uh, across three uh, cities in China. Two weeks ago, I was with uh, 15 uh, of our companies, and we went from, uh, particularly with a focus on technology, uh, from uh, San Francisco right through uh, to New York. I can tell you that there is major interest in Northern Ireland. I estimate that a huge percentage of what I do, I cannot tell you until the ink is dry on the contracts because they are commercially sensitive. There is huge interest in Northern Ireland because we have three unique things. We have business costs that are about 84-85% of the rest of the United Kingdom. We have got a talent pool and a very low attrition rate. In fact, 80% of all the businesses that have invested in Northern Ireland have subsequently reinvested. And I'm grateful for those businesses when I bring in new investors for actually telling a success story. And then we have the attraction of corporation tax giving us the most competitive corporation tax rate in Western Europe. Call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, given the key role played by our manufacturing sector to economic growth in Northern Ireland, why there is no manufacturing strategy currently in place with long-term commitments and targets on key issues like rates, energy and infrastructure? Well, I think the member knows the answer to that question because his party uh, was party to the economic strategy. And his party agreed that we would put all of our strategy into one specific strategy, which was the economic strategy, uh, which his party at executive level uh, agreed to. Uh, manufacturing is a very important sector for Northern Ireland. I don't take away from anybody who's lost their job. Anybody that grew up as I did in the 70s and 80s in Belfast and watched their families and people lose jobs know how devastating that actually is. But equally, the manufacturing sector uh, is telling me of the successes that they are having, and they have been performing well. Uh, over the past year, they have added 4,000 additional jobs. The manufacturing output is up by nearly 3%. And that's more than the UK average. And uh, what we want to do is ensure that we continue with a strong recovery. That's why specific things I've done for manufacturing, if you look at Bombardier, what I did there, to try and help them address their energy costs. We had also a proposal on the table with Michelin. We're never going to know what would have happened had they have taken uh, that up. And last week I spent with about 15 companies who are all high uh, energy users the manufacturing sector down at Montupe, and we spent quite a bit of time looking at where the strengths, the weaknesses and the opportunities were coming from. And I also, as the House knows, have established a manufacturing energy task force. It's being chaired by a person who's the fifth largest uh, energy user, as I understand it, uh, in Northern Ireland, and I wait their outcome and I intend to give it very due diligence to see how we can further support the sector. Mr Jim Allister. The Minister describes the reduction that's pending in corporation tax as a game changer. Can I explain why it didn't change the game in my constituency for either JTI or Michelin, who are leaving our shores sadly approximately at the time when reduction in corporation tax will come? Clearly, it didn't impress them as something causing them to make it worthwhile to stay. So is it really the game changer? that the Minister proclaims it to be, because experience to date 
in my constituency doesn't suggest so. Well, I think the member raises some very important points about Michelin specifically. Um, I've spent several hours not only trying to ensure that we get that workforce, all the qualifications and be, are in the best place to get new jobs, but I also spent quite a bit of time with the Michelin management. I asked them, was there anything more that government could have done? Uh, they told me no. When I asked them the reasons and to list the reasons out uh, as to why they left uh, North Antrim, they explained to me that there was thousands of a glut uh, of the truck tyre market. It's a very specific uh, product that was produced there. And they talked about fluctuations in the euro currency. Uh, they talked about Asian imports of £130 against what I believe was a vastly superior Michelin product, what was costing over £500. But what I can tell the member is there is a huge interest uh, in Northern Ireland. When companies come to me like Allstate and say to me, Jonathan, we came for the costs, we stayed for your people. When comp other companies like City come to provide hundreds of jobs and are now providing somewhere in the region of 2,000 jobs. When we see the, the Randoxes, we see the right buses in your constituency uh, tripling their profits and talking about what they could do uh, into the future. I think if we present that collective message of low cost, low tax and an excellent workforce, we've got a winning message for the economy in Northern Ireland. Mr Ian Milne for a question. Question five, the Hall. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Invest Northern Ireland's role is to support companies uh, that bring forward investment projects that are based on merit. Uh, it's irrespective of, of where they are based. Through local government reform and the process of community planning, councils can shape job investment in their regions by tailoring a sub-regional proposition to drive investment in and set relevant targets for their respective areas. Invest Northern Ireland will assist in the development of those council-led sub-regional strategies to help drive economic development on an equitable basis throughout Northern Ireland. I call Mr Millen for supplementary. Sure, my good last one, Collier, my weakest on era, uh, Don Fregger, a hug to you, to show. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Um, thank, uh, can I ask the Minister to detail his department's success or other ways in uh, securing investment, and in particular in the Mid Ulster area, which I represent, uh, the south area end of it? Very good. Well, I mean, during the, during the period 2011, uh, 12, 14, 15, uh, Invest in Northern Ireland support totaled £118 million. Pounds. That contributed to planned investment of £673 million pounds in areas that were west of the River Ban. This support also helped businesses promote 9,679 jobs. Uh, during the same period, businesses in this area created some 7,416 jobs. And those figures include the assistance and the investment totaling 15 million and 20 million that was offered to external delivery organizations and universities, which also promoted uh, six jobs. I mean, the number of jobs promoted and created in each area is directly proportional to the adult population for that area. 27% uh, of the adult population resides in the West, and that's directly comparable to 26% of jobs promoted and 27% of jobs created by businesses with Invest Northern Ireland support. Call Mr. Jared Dover. Minister, I have to say, given the description that you've given us today of prosperity and jobs coming forward, coming from the constituency of Foyle, I think it's almost like Harold Macmillan saying we've never had it so good. I'd have to say that uh, given the fact that the Executive's North West Ministerial Group has only met twice in the last year, does the Minister think that that's appropriate action for the level of disadvantage that we face? And should we be looking at a bespoke issue like a city deal for Derry? I, mean, I can understand the member um, needing to make a sound bite, but he should not talk down the area that he represents, because uh, he will know uh, if he's been following for the last 12 months what I've done specifically in that area, what I've done publicly. Uh, I've also been in the area privately on a number of occasions, 
and want to see fruit grow from that. But you will know that uh, with one source virtual, with the Metaverse Mod Squad, with the Uprint Technologies jobs announcements that we have created, um, with Invest support, um, there have been hundreds of new jobs created in his particular area. And if he doesn't know that, he should know that. Because when I was down addressing the Chamber of Commerce, uh, when I was uh, down uh, speaking to the skills sector and people involved with universities, there is an upbeat nature, a can-do nature, which I want to facilitate from the small, such as the Oak Grove Calvins in his area, which is creating an absolute quality premium product for, for export, uh, right through to those big jobs announcements between Metaverse and Mod Squad, which is like hundreds of jobs in that particular area. And I think what we do is we build on it. And you come with me and I'll support you 100% in trying to bring business into the area to tell people you have 84% of the business costs of the rest of the UK. You have a very well-educated people in that specific area. And you've got, in 1st of April 2018, the most competitive rate of corporation tax. Now, that should be a winning message. Order. That ends the period for list of questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mrs. Judith Cochrane. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, um, does he acknowledge that the levels of economic inactivity represent a structural problem within our economy that must be tackled? Yes. Yes, I do. And uh, I've had tremendous support in the one year that I've been in this particular office, but also seeing what uh, Mr. Farias, Minister, did uh, in uh, trying to ensure that we address that long-term uh, economic inactivity. We're seeing it reducing, but it's only reducing by percentage points, and we want that to reduce further. Mr. Cochrane, for supplement. Thank you, and I thank the Minister um, for his answer and the fact that he, he does acknowledge that there is an issue there. What steps does he believe that can, can be taken in the coming months to identify the financial resources to begin the implementation of the Executive's economic inactivity strategy that his department co-produced with Dell? Well, what, what we have been trying to do is to ensure that that budget uh, delivers against what we set out the strategy for. I know the uh, Minister uh, of Dell also had some discussions, as most of us did in our departments, uh, with the First Minister when she was Finance Minister, and there was extra money uh, allocated directly uh, into skills. I don't think any of us got everything that we wanted, but there was a recognition there that we have a, a wonderful opportunity that's coming in front of us. And what we've got to ensure, and I should say also that Minister Farry was out with me uh, in the States, and we went to a number of specific companies to look at what we can do together in terms of economic inactivity, but also the excellent work he's doing in bespoke training for companies and the success that they take the training through and the person only has to interview the client at the end of it, but they're delivering real success. And I think that's the right model to go with the business model to then back it up with training. And I say in the future, uh, we will try and align in the new department of the economy the skills to factor in to the economic jobs we know we can and I believe we will have. Mr Stuart Dixon for topical question. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. Minister, um, perhaps you could outline for us uh, and tell the House indeed um, the representations that you've received from businesses and industry about their concern of the negative impact of an exit of the United Kingdom from the EU. I should actually, when I'm getting to my feet, correct the record. I made a mistake last week and talked about the, uh, not knowing the nature of the question. I should have said the nature of the terms, and I'll correct that record. Business has spoken to me, in an, and not exclusively with one voice. Uh, there are differing uh, approaches that are being made. What I've tried to do is say to people, we have commissioned Oxford Economics to try to provide the best information for people uh, to examine against what may or may not come next week. Mr Dixon for supplementary. Th thank you and thank the Minister for, for his answer thus far. Minister, with a First Minister uh, leaning towards out, uh, is it likely that you will be the only enterprise minister in the United Kingdom who is anti-EU and will be uh, leading that charge against industry and business in Northern Ireland? 
let me say first of all, uh, I support the position adopted by Mrs. Foster's First Minister 100%. Uh, and the position that's been adopted by our MEP and our parliamentary leader. Uh, what I have asked people to do is to look seriously at the information that we're commissioning from Oxford Economics on the range of options and to examine it against what terms uh, come through. The Gordon Lyons for topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, could the um, minister give uh, his assessment uh, of the tourist potential of Northern Ireland and what actions his department have taken to promote tourism in Northern Ireland? Well, I mean, tourism in Northern Ireland is going from strength to strength. I think the last set of figures that I looked at were £751 uh, million, uh, pounds, and we intend to grow that to a £1 billion pounds industry by 2020. I get very encouraged when I hear about 81 cruise ships uh, all coming into Northern Ireland. I get very encouraged when I see statistics for Titanic at 2.53 million. I get very encouraged when, as I announced on Friday, 100 major Chinese uh, tour operators uh, are going to come and visit Northern Ireland in the next number of weeks. And the potential of that uh, is uh, absolutely huge. I had them down at Mount Stewart, and they were quite frankly blown away with what they could offer. And they were telling me that they thought surely that they could uh, attract significant numbers of Asian tourists, one of the biggest markets in the world, uh, to come to Northern Ireland. Of course, the members' own constituency, I know the Goblins Cliff Path, and I mean, this is a feature uh, that when you put it all alongside Titanic, the Geo Park uh, in the West, you put it aside Mount Stewart House, and you combine all of those, you see why we have got a unique tourist offering in Northern Ireland and why I'm confident that we should achieve our target of a billion pounds industry by 2020. Mr Lyons for supplement. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm very pleased that the Minister has highlighted um, the Gobbins Cliff Path as one of the um, good attractions that we have uh, in, in our constituency. Uh, however, we do have a, a slight problem. It's great to hear that so many good things are happening within tourism at the minute, but uh, an awful lot of people um, will go to Titanic Belfast and then perhaps go up to the North Coast. Wouldn't it be a good idea for more tourists to go uh, via the East Antrim Coast to visit uh, Carrick Fergus, to visit the Antrim Coast Road, and uh, to go to the Gobbins Cliff Path? Would he uh, agree to work with and to meet Mid and East Antrim Borough Council so we can work out how we can maximise the tourist potential of that area? Thank you. Oh, of course, I'll meet with the Council. The member was with me at the previous occasion. Uh, when we met with the Council specifically uh, on the tourism initiative. And I'll continue to work with them again because I want all of Northern Ireland uh, to benefit from the tourism that comes in. And what we have found out is that when people come and visit us, they like it and they come back and they want to bring their family and they want to bring their friends. Part of our challenge is to make sure they come uh, and, and visit us uh, specifically. And that whole uh, causeway coastal route uh, is worthy of international appeal and it has been identified as an area both for growth for visitors numbers uh, but also for spend. And when you add in the other things that are going on just in the periphery, the huge success of Game of Thrones uh, tourism, the fact the Irish Open in 2017 I think had 107,000, um, sorry 2015 had 107,000 paying spectators and we get the Irish Open back again uh, in 2017. We'll also have one of the biggest tournaments in the world, the Open uh, 2019. And you compare that up against things uh, that are also there, the, the, the Women's Rugby World Cup, and the strength that my department's putting in to try to track the Rugby World Cup uh, to Ireland and the potential of some 350,000 rugby supporters, uh, how we could maximise that benefit for Northern Ireland. You can see how I think we can all be encouraged at the tourism offering. Mr Alistair Patters. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I just want to ask the Minister, when the closure of the Renewable Heat Incentive Scheme takes effect, considering legislation on the 18th of November 15 clearly stated to the sector a closure of the 31st of March 2016? Well, look, I think what I'd said earlier uh, in relation, and I welcome the uh, member uh, to the House, that there has been a huge increase in demand for the Renewable Heat Incentive Scheme at the end of last year. And that does not just give my department, it gives Northern Ireland a huge budgetary pressure. 
because the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, as a member should know, decided to limit the amount of money that was paid to Northern Ireland out of the UK pot for renewable heat. And that's why I signalled my intention last week to ease that financial pressure, uh, which could amount to over £27 uh, million. Pounds. Patterson for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I welcome the comments of the Minister and his welcome to this House. The Minister announced the sudden closure of the Renewable Heat Initiative after 6 p.m. last Friday in a press release. In his press release, he mentioned around 6 per cent of Northern Ireland's heating needs are now provided through renewable technologies. Executive's programme for government renewable heat target is 10 per cent by 2020. Has the Minister abandoned that target? Does he even have an, an incentive policy for renewables anymore? A lot of people and firms have invested money into this and need answers from the Minister. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is, of course, that the, the target that we have set for now we have exceeded. And uh, I want to listen specifically to the industry. I've been listening to individuals who are currently installing the renewable heat boilers. And I think it's important that everyone in this House and all of us as politicians uh, listen and do all that we can to help as many people as possible. And I'll reflect on what is being said to me. I'll examine ways in which I can help those uh, who have been affected by my decision uh, last week. And I want to say also, inevitably there will be an investigation into why we have found ourselves in this position. And I've urgently asked my own officials to ensure that the scheme is running to the letter and also to the spirit of the law. And I'll be keeping a very, very close eye on that. But I think the member also needs to understand too that the Chancellor of the Exchequer limited the amount of money that's been paid to Northern Ireland out of the UK pot for renewable heat. And that puts challenges on every member in this House. Mr. Alistair Ross for topical question. Well, the Minister will be aware that the Employment Bill is currently working its way through the House today in order to reform employment law here in Northern Ireland. He mentioned in a previous answer about business cost, talent pool and corporation tax being three of the real drivers to get investors to come to Northern Ireland. How important is the employment law environment when he is talking to investors who are thinking about coming to Northern Ireland? Well, any investor will want to consider the employment legislation against uh, the backdrop uh, of putting a significant amount of investment into Northern Ireland. I do have to say that in all of my discussions from Asia to America and, and quite a bit of time spent through Europe, uh, when they look at Northern Ireland, they are looking specifically to a, a talent pool with a very low rate of attrition. I think in some cases it is less than 7 per cent. Uh, they are looking to save in terms of business costs and they are attracted by having in the future the lowest rate of corporation tax in Western Europe. I think all of that has helped us drive uh, oral employment in the region of uh, 6% against a European average above 9%. And uh, in Ireland, last I looked, was 8.9%. So we are in a very competitive position. We cannot rest on our laurels. We have a unique opportunity of 30,000 jobs in front of us. The challenge is for us to ensure that we've got young people with the skills to rise to that challenge and also to ensure that as uh, people progress, we also see a decrease in economic inactivity. Mr. Ross, for supplement. Thank you. And the Minister has talked about the competitive nature of, of attracting investors to Northern Ireland. One of the elements of the Employment Bill going through today is an amendment that would allow Northern Ireland's qualifying period for unfair dismissal to be the same as that in GB. Would he share my concern that if Northern Ireland is a different uh, uh, employment law environment than perhaps somewhere in Glasgow or Liverpool, when investors are considering whether to go to Liverpool or Glasgow or Belfast, that we'd be a, we would be at a disadvantage if we haven't kept a, a step with change in employment law in GB? Yes, and let me answer it in, in this particular way. One of, one of the groups uh, that I was with, and I maybe shouldn't name a chief executive, uh, but he said when they came to create hundreds of jobs and are sitting in a position where they've created quite literally uh, thousands of jobs, one of the things he said was specific to Northern Ireland 
was people loved the fact on an international market basis that in terms of compliance, in terms of law and in terms of regulation, we were, we were on the same page right across the United Kingdom. So you could have all the advantages of United Kingdom business uh, with lower costs, I would say a very attractive pool, uh, employment pool to work from, one of the best educated, and into the future, the, the lowest rate of corporation tax in Western Europe. But it has been mentioned to me that that compliance right across the United Kingdom, and particularly the regulation across the United Kingdom, has led to further investment in Northern Ireland. Mr Gregory Campbell is not in his place. A very short supplementary from Mr Paul Girvan. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Chair. Uh, speaker, uh, I want to ask the Minister in relation to the International Airport has made some announcements recently uh, associated with a, a number of new jobs. I am wondering what measures the Minister has taken to ensure that we as a region maybe get some uh, help in relation to APD, seeing we are competing with uh, Dublin 100 miles down the road with zero APD, and the Scottish Islands have had some flexibility. I appreciate that we are tied to the UK system. Have we lobbied for the uh, abolition of APD? Minister, can you do that in a few seconds? Yes, I, mean, I, I want to first of all congratulate Graham Kerry and a marvellous team uh, for the success that they have done, not just in job creation, but also uh, in terms of increased numbers. And I think what I, I will look at, I believe the UK as a whole should address air passenger duty, and we lobby very, very strongly uh, for that to happen. Uh, but that doesn't take away from the fact that it should happen, I think, too, on a UK-wide basis to drive tourism in Northern Ireland. I'll continue to work with uh, all of our airports. I've been to City of Derry. I've, I've seen the success uh, of Belfast City, both, again, in terms of uh, increased numbers and the boost for the economy. But there is a really good news story in the members' constituency, and I will look uh, at every avenue I have, not just lobbying the UK and our passenger duty, but also seeing what we could do in terms of our route development funds and marketing strategies that could lead to continued further success. Order time is up. That point of order. Um, is, is it in order to, uh, despite our many differences, to commend the Minister on the alert logic a job investment in Belfast yesterday, which incredibly he didn't mention? Certainly, I think the House I'm, I'm sure that's not a point of order, but the Minister will have heard it. Myself, I was another business which I hope uh, in the long term will deliver for the economy of Northern Ireland. I invite members to take their ease while we change the top table.